We read the Word of God this morning as it is found in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And we will read verses 18 through 25. And these are the verses that we will consider this morning also as the text. Matthew chapter 1 beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. This morning, beloved congregation, we consider the beginning of what is called here in our Bibles, the Gospel according to Matthew. Notice that this is not the Gospel of Matthew. This is not Matthew's Gospel. There is one gospel that has one source, and that is God. It is the gospel of God according to Matthew. Therefore, and this is important, we understand that this is not a different gospel from what we read of in Luke or in Mark or in John. It's all one gospel. One gospel that has one source. The gospel that comes from God that proclaims the very same message, the good news of the glad tidings, not only of the birth of Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus Christ is really the beginning of the gospel, the foundation for the rest that we are told in the gospel accounts about Jesus Christ. And really the foundation for the rest that we are told in all of the rest of the New Testament about Jesus Christ not only coming to be born, but to die, to rise again, to ascend into heaven, and to send forth His apostles to go forth into every nation preaching, teaching, and making disciples and baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation of it all. It all makes sense only because of the way that Jesus Christ was born. So we consider the birth of Jesus Christ from the point of view of Matthew this morning, recognizing that we don't, don't hear a different gospel than what we hear in Luke, but we do find different details, of course. We see that in the text... 
Here in the text, we find the only place that Scripture mentions the appearance of the angel to Joseph to explain to him the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. We also find here in the text and all throughout Matthew an emphasis that you find in Luke and in Mark and in John, but an emphasis that is especially strong and clear in Matthew, that this Jesus is the Christ, the fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures, the one promised by God in all the Old Testament to come as the Messiah, the Christ. That's the point of the genealogy at the beginning of Matthew that we did not read. That genealogy has this as one of its great purposes. To point to Jesus and to say He is the fulfillment of the promise made that the Christ would come out of the royal tribe of Judah and out of the royal house of David. That's who this Jesus is. And He is the fulfillment the prophecy made long ago in Isaiah 7, verse 14, concerning the virgin birth. So we consider this morning the birth of Jesus Christ from the point of view of Matthew, recognizing this too. We read here of wonder. We read here of a unique birth. A birth that is a miracle. We read here of a wonder work of God in accomplishing the conception of Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ through a virgin. And then too, and this especially, we read of the wonder the astounding marvel and miracle that Jesus Christ Himself is. This is no ordinary baby. This is no ordinary child. This is a unique and marvelous child who would do, and the text speaks of that too, marvelous and wonderful things. And so, we need to know that this morning so that we will recognize once again, this isn't new, but we'll see this once again. The story of Jesus' birth is not told to us by God through Matthew or through Luke. In order to satisfy our curiosity, in order that we will be able to understand and comprehend all that came to pass. But rather the story is told by God through Matthew with this calling, yea, even this command. Know and believe. This is how the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And this is who the Lord Jesus Christ is. So for a little while this morning, consider with me the story of Jesus' birth. That's what we have here. Matthew tells us here in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Here's the birth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to consider in the first place the marriage of Joseph and Mary. It's important that we understand that properly this morning. And then in the second place, we are going to consider the fulfillment of A prophecy. That's important that we understand. That's part of the story of Jesus' birth. This child is the fulfillment of prophecy. And then finally, here's the heart of it all. This is the story of the arrival of the Savior. And so the story of Jesus' birth, the marriage of Joseph and Mary, the fulfillment of prophecy, and the arrival of the Savior. Matthew says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, and then he goes to explain to us all of the circumstances surrounding 
the marriage of Joseph and Mary. And it is important in understanding the birth of Jesus Christ that we understand the relationship of Joseph and Mary, that we understand that relationship correctly. When Mary, and we're not told of that here in Matthew, but when Mary was told by the angel that she was going to give birth to a son, she was not engaged in the way that we would think of it, but she was espoused, betrothed to be married to this man named Joseph. A man of the tribe of Judah. A man of the house of David. A man that you might think then from a human point of view would be the appropriate father of the Christ. But Matthew tells us this story this morning from God through Matthew in order so that we will understand that although it was God's will, this was God's will, that Joseph take Mary to be his wife, Joseph, from a biological point of view, is not the father of Jesus Christ. We can see that in Joseph's response to the fact that Mary was found to be with child. Now Joseph didn't know everything that we read right away in the text. She was found to be with child of the Holy Ghost. No. Joseph knows that this woman who is committed to be his wife, who is really by law considered to be his wife in every way except that they don't live together yet in the same home. Joseph knows that this woman is with child and that's it. And when the text says that she was found to be with child, we need to understand that doesn't mean that now it was commonly known by many people that it was a public matter of knowledge that Mary was with child. The only other person who knew this was her cousin Elizabeth. But it was Joseph who, observing Mary, seeing a subtle change in Mary, was able to come to the conclusion she's with child. And we can see in the thinking of Joseph, we have a confirmation of the fact that when we look at Joseph's thinking, this child is not his. No. Joseph, knowing that the child is not his, thinking that the child must be begotten by another man, assumes, and not sinfully, wrongly, but not sinfully, assumes Mary has been with another man. She has committed the sin of adultery. And because that was not a public matter, and because the law of God in Deut Deuteronomy 32 did not necessarily require that it be made public, Joseph determined that he was going to put her away and divorce her in private. Now, here's where one of the mysteries come in. We might ask the question, well, why didn't Mary tell Joseph about what had happened? Why didn't she go to him as her espoused husband and say to him, no, I am with child, but no, I'm not with child of another man. You need to understand. An angel came to me and told me that this is how it would happen. The Holy Spirit would come upon me. Why didn't Mary tell him that? We can't answer that with any certainty. Perhaps as a young woman, she didn't know how to explain that to Joseph. And perhaps because this was so unique, because this had never happened before, Mary didn't know where to begin to tell Joseph. And maybe too, she believed God 
will explain this to Joseph. And so it happened on this wise. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Not to censure Joseph, not to tell Joseph that any of his thinking was sinful, or to tell him that any of his actions were sinful. But nevertheless, to tell Joseph, you're wrong, Joseph. The conclusion that you have drawn is perfectly logical, of course, from a human point of view. But you need to see here, Joseph, that there is a wonder of God at work here. A wonder of God that you couldn't have known except that it's made known to you through a divine special revelation. And so the angel comes to Joseph and says to him, that which is conceived in Mary is not of a man. She is a pure and a chaste virgin. That which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Ghost. And so, Joseph, fear not to take Mary unto thyself to be thy wife. This was all told to Joseph in a dream. Joseph understood that this was the word of God to him and that the will of God to, for him was this, that he, he take Mary to be his lawful wife. And we see that Joseph was a just man and a man of faith that as soon as he awoke from his sleep, he went into action. And soon after this, he took Mary to be his wife, knowing that this is what God wanted. And God surely did want Joseph to take Mary to be his wife so that the Lord Jesus Christ conceived before they were married would be born after they were married. So that it is quite clear to us that God did not want Joseph and Mary to be married so that through them Together, Joseph and Mary, he could cause Christ to be born. That's what many people, not only in the world, but also in the church, say today, denying the wonder of the work of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But God doesn't want us to think that. That's why God inspired Matthew to tell us this story of Jesus' birth to tell us about how Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married and how they did actually come to be married so that we will know that the child was conceived before they were married and that Joseph knew not his wife before they were married or even while they were married until the child Jesus Christ was born. If it wasn't necessary for them to be married in order for God to send Christ into the world, then why was this the will of God? Again, this is one of those questions that we do not understand with certainty, but it does appear that God was concerned about the reputation of Mary. That God didn't want Mary to be exposed to the claim that she was an adulteress, that she was guilty of sexual sin. God wanted Joseph to take her to be his wife to protect Mary from all of that scandal, from all of that gossip that might come from the lips of profane and unholy people. But this was also important with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. God had determined to send His Son into the world without the contribution or the will of a man. And God wants it to be known and declared plainly here in Matthew that His Son was not born by a man, but that He was not conceived not only by Joseph, but not by any other man. So it may never be said that Jesus Christ is the product of an adulterous relationship, a sexually sinful relationship. And that's never been the claim. No one has ever made that charge. And God kept that charge from being made by having Joseph take Mary to be 
his wife. And so the testimony to you and me this morning is this is how the birth of Jesus Christ happened. He was conceived without the will of man by the Holy Spirit of God and therefore born of a virgin. And all of this was done, we are told in verse 22, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. This tells us this morning, this told Joseph and Mary then, and tells you and me today, the Lord Jesus Christ at his birth, it's everything God said he would be. And everything God wanted him to be. So that he could do absolutely everything God wanted him to do. That's important. Because you know, Jesus Christ was not everything that the Jews wanted him to be. He didn't fit all of the qualifications they wanted the Christ to have. Oh yes, they wanted the Christ to come. They looked for the Christ to come. They wanted him to come to be born of a king, not of a lowly carpenter. And they wanted him to come in great earthly splendor and glory, the glory of a king not in the lowly circumstances in which he was actually born. Because they looked on Jesus Christ not by faith through the Word of God, but they looked on Jesus Christ with their earthly eyes according to their own standards and expectations, wanting to have a king who would deliver them from the hand of Rome. And because they didn't see that in Jesus Christ, they were disappointed. Utterly disappointed in what they saw. Just as, when it comes down to it, there are many people today who are celebrating Christmas who really have no interest in Jesus Christ. And if you were to ask them about what they thought about Jesus Christ, you would find out that they were disappointed in Him. He doesn't fit their expectations of the Savior that they want. He doesn't fit the agenda that they would have for a Savior. Which agenda really always comes down to this for those who do not believe. That they want a Savior who is going to give them a rich, prosperous, easy, earthly life. And if that's how we look on Jesus, we look upon Him as a Savior in some kind of earthly sense this morning, will be disappointed in who He is. But those who have faith hear the Word of God this morning. The Word of God that says, this Jesus born of the Virgin Mary is everything that I want Him to be. Everything that I promised Him to be. Everything that I desire him and require him to be. He is the Christ. We see that here in verse 17, where at the end of the genealogy we are told by Matthew all of the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ. There it is, Matthew saying. Here is the one promised. Everything that God said about him. Here in this Jesus. He's the Christ. And understand, not really the fulfillment only of one prophecy of Scripture. This is the first one that Matthew points to here in verses 22 and 23. In order to say... In a sense, well, here it is. Here He is as the fulfillment of all prophecy, all that God has said. 
And there is a sense in which this one is the heart of it all. Because if this is who He is, if He is Emmanuel, that is God with us, God in human flesh, then He can be and is everything God promised, everything we need for our salvation from sin. And the prophecy that is fulfilled is that of Isaiah 7, verse 14. And what a wonderful prophecy it is. It's at a dark time in the history of the people of God in the Old Testament. The kingdom is divided. There's the kingdom of Judah in the south, where the royal line of David is still found. And the kingdom of Israel to the north, living in schism and division from the line of Jesus Christ. The king at this time is the godless king Ahaz. And the kingdom of Judah is threatened by reason, the king of Syria, and by Pekah, the king of Israel. At the time that the prophecy comes, Isaiah meets Ahaz as he's standing at the edge of the city of Jerusalem, looking at the fortification of the city because it has been told to him that Reason and Pekah are talking together, planning, plotting to attack and to destroy the kingdom of Judah. And Ahaz is looking at the fortifications thinking, how are we ever going to stand against all of this might? of these two great kings and their armies. God sent the prophet to him in that dark time to bring a word of encouragement. It's not going to happen. They will not defeat you or the kingdom of Judah. Instead, Syria is going to fall and in six to five years, the northern kingdom of Israel will be destroyed. And the prophet says, you need to put all your hope in God, Ahaz. You need to believe His word and His promise that He's the hope, that He is the Redeemer and the Savior of Judah. And the prophet said to him, if you won't believe, you won't stand. And then he said, In order that you may know that this Word of God is true, ask for a sign. Ask for any sign that you want. In the earth beneath, if you ask for a sign in the earth, God will give you a sign in the earth. Or in the heaven above, ask for a sign in the heavens and God will give you a sign. Wicked King Ahaz, pretending to be pious, said, I won't tempt the Lord and ask for a sign. And what he really meant was, I don't believe in God. I have no interest in God's word, his assurances, his promises, his sign, his salvation. You see, he had already determined in his faithless unbelief that he was going to look to the king of Assyria for help in this time of trouble. Then the prophet said to him, you're going to weary not only men, you're going to weary God. And you're not going to ask for a sign. Well, God will give you a sign. And this will be the sign unto you, Ahaz. The sign of judgment to you and to all that do not believe. A virgin is going to conceive. She's going to give birth to a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. God with us. Therefore we see in the birth of Jesus Christ, judgment upon all the wicked and all of those who are unbelieving. That's really the sign first of all. But it's also a sign to all of them then. And that day who believed. And all today who believed too. A sign. This is what God will do for the salvation of His people. He'll do wonders. He'll cause a virgin to conceive. 
It's at this point we need to understand that Isaiah in his prophecy does not speak merely of a young woman, as some people like to think today. He doesn't speak, of course he doesn't speak merely of a young woman conceiving and bearing a child. That wouldn't be a sign of anything. That wouldn't capture our attention. That wouldn't be unique or wonderful. That happens all of the time. That's rather ordinary. But this, a virgin conceiving, that's never happened. Never happened. How could that happen? But, and this is the point, but by the will and the work of God. God is at work through the virgin of sending forth Emmanuel, God in human flesh. That's what that name means. It means literally God with us or with us God. And that speaks of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why He had to be born of a virgin. This is why He had to be conceived by the Holy Ghost. This is why it's very important that we believe that Joseph is not his father, nor is any other man his father. God is his father, even according to the flesh. So that He could be God come in human flesh. What a wonder. How astounded the people must have been in the days of Isaiah. The Messiah is coming. He will be born of a woman. He'll be a man. But he'll be God. And how we yet wonder at that today. The most astounding truth and reality ever. God come in human flesh. This is the story of Jesus' birth. Infinite God becoming finite man. Almighty God becoming weak man. Eternal, everywhere present God becoming a man limited and bound by time and space. God becoming man and yet remaining God. God becoming Finite, weak, time-bound, space-bound man, and yet at the same time remaining infinite, almighty, everywhere present, all-knowing, eternal God. That's what happened when Jesus was born. Therefore, Jesus Christ is everything, absolutely everything that God required and that we need to be our Savior. How else can we explain the rest of the Gospel of Matthew and the rest of the New Testament? How else could He be the one who is able to live in this world a perfectly sinless life. Except that Joseph's not his father. He's not guilty of the sin of Adam. And he is not one who received a sinful nature from his parents. How else could he be the one to perform all of the miracles that we read of? The blind receiving their sight, the deaf receiving their hearing, the lame receiving the ability to walk, the dead being raised from the grave. Except, this is how He was born. Conceived of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary. So that He could be God come in the flesh. How else could He at the cross represent us 
take our sins upon Himself except that He was born of a woman and He came into this world to be like us in every way, sin accepted. And how else could He at the cross pay for our sins and sustain the wrath of God except that He is God come in human flesh. How else could He rise again from the dead? Ascend into heaven. Sit at the right hand of God to rule over all things. Except that He is Emmanuel. God come in the flesh. How else could you and I have any hope for the church today? How else could you and I ever have any certainty that the church will not be swallowed up by the world or by Satan? But that all things that are happening in the world, even now as we see many things that disturb us, how else could we believe that all things are happening for the salvation of the church? Except we believe this. God came in human flesh. And that He is not only God with His people then. Yes, that was the confession of Joseph and Mary. Can you imagine what that must have been like? When finally Joseph and Mary could talk to each other and Joseph could say to Mary, Mary, I want to take you to be my wife because I understand now an angel came to me. An angel came to me and told me that this baby in your womb was not, not by another man, but that the Holy Spirit has worked in your womb. And then can you imagine what Mary must have said to Joseph? What joy must have been in her heart to be able to say, Yes, Joseph, I couldn't tell you before, but an angel came to me too and told me the very same thing, that it wasn't going to be another man, but the power of God was going to come upon me and that then I would become by the Holy Spirit with child. And then Joseph and Mary must have thought, then and then when he was born, born to later on of this prophecy and said, this is God with us. And think of what comfort, the glorious comfort that gave to them. But now know that this is true of you and me too. When we by faith look at the birth of Jesus Christ and we believe this word, we're able to say, with joy in our hearts. This is who Jesus is. God with us. Not understand God who will be with us in heaven. Although that's the promise here in the name Emmanuel. But God with us now. And that's the one very slight but very important difference between Isaiah 7 verse 14 and what we read of here in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. In Isaiah 7, it's a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and she shall call his name Emmanuel. But here, the virgin shall conceive. She shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's you and me. That's the church in every age. Jesus is God with us. We believe that. We believe that because he was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, that because He is God, He was able to pay for our sins on the cross as our Savior, Jesus. We believe that He was able to conquer death, to ascend into heaven. He's able to be with us now by His Word and His Spirit. So that we say today and every day, this is who Jesus is. God with us. And we experience that every Sunday under the preaching of the Word. We experience that every day as we read the Word of God. We experience that through our prayers. 
We experience this in the church. We experience this in our marriages and in our homes and in our families. This is our assurance with regard to our life here on this earth. Our assurance with regard to our children too. We are able to say, God is with us and with them. Beloved, this name Emmanuel tells us that Jesus Christ is the one who came was able to pay for our sins as God and man, and therefore able to reconcile us with God and establish the reality of God's covenant. That's what He is. God's covenant. In His own person in nature. God with man. God dwelling with man. God and man united together in friendship and fellowship. That's Jesus Christ. But remember, the name is not God with me, but God with us. God come to bear the name Jesus. That He might pay for the sins of His people to remove the cause of separation and enmity, and to bring about God's fellowship and friendship with His people forever. But now too, so that we can say this morning, we don't understand it all. can't explain all of this. The Holy Ghost working in the womb of a woman A virgin conceiving and bringing forth a child. God come in the flesh. But we don't need to explain it. God does. Through Matthew. And we believe it. And in believing it, we know this. Jesus Christ is everything we need. Has done everything we need and will do everything we need for our salvation that we might now and forever be with God. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank Thee for the great gift that Thou hast given unto us in the birth of Jesus Christ and then in everything everything He did and everything He's still doing in accomplishing the great goal of reconciling us with Thee that we with Thee might live forever and ever in perfect peace and friendship. Father, give us faith to believe For Jesus' sake do we pray. Amen.